Okay, so I have you really close into the work today because I have some special techniques to show you. And uh, I think it's going to be interesting because the techniques are called Grizzai, G-R-I-S-A-I-L-L-E, and the other one is glazing. And I think glazing is the better known technique of the two, but they are both techniques that were extensively used by the old masters since uh, sometime in the 15th century. And um, I have a Jan van Eyck uh, painting in my thumbnail. And it's a portrait of a man that was thought to have possibly been a self-portrait by him. And this made use of glazing technique. And he was really one of the inventors of it, as far as I'm aware. And uh, oil painting sort of, he was one of the sort of forerunners of the invention of oil painting, you know. So um, this has been around for centuries. These two techniques have been around for centuries and not just Jan van Eyck, but later people like Titian uh, would have used these techniques. Uh, to great effect, as you can see, if you have a look at that Jan van Eyck picture. And I will also, uh, I'll stick the link in a comment maybe after the live stream's over. Um, Rembrandt, who is a favorite of mine, was fantastic at use of glazes. And I want to explain to you what's so fantastic about glazing and grisaille which is a related technique that you can use with glazing. And this is a way to really up your game in painting. And although the old masters, as they call them, use these techniques, they're still very, very relevant techniques and very applicable to any contemporary artist working. And I think that you would have a great time messing about with these techniques. So the, my thinking is that I'll show you basically how these two techniques work. And then you can do your own experiments and mess about with these techniques and see what happens. And I think you'll really have a very enjoyable time doing that. So, um, you know, I just have a painting under the camera here at the moment. And this is actually glazed, this painting. And it's a highly experimental painting. <laughs> but... um. You know, it went through phases where I was liking it, not liking it. And I actually like it at the moment, even though there's a lot of things in it that kind of are weird happening. Um, there's a lot of glazing that I felt were um, really nice things happening. So you can see, uh, hopefully, if I have the sweet spot for the camera, because I can't really focus it properly myself, it just auto focuses to a particular um a particular um, distance. But, for example, up in this section of the painting, those colours weren't um, arrived at uh, by me mixing up the co colours individually. They were, um, I had colour on, on this already, but I worked with um, thin glazes over the colour that was there to create more subtlety of colour and more kind of weird transitions and things in here and to get the glazes to bring up the texture of the paint itself because there are some bits that are thick paint or impasto. I'm working a lot with impasto at the, mo at the moment. I'll show you some pieces in a while. Um, it's meant to, the glaze is meant to kind of stick into those and bring out the, the lovely texture. So I was working with the idea of nice texture and a nice colour and intensity of colour here. And somebody like Jan van Eyck, uh, the intensity of the colour in his painting, as you can see it, uh, particularly in the turban on the that self-portrait on the head of the guy in it, um, that intensity of colour has been described as a kind of a jewel-like effect. And indeed, some of his painting of um, very fine detail in paintings was so 
um, jewel-like in its intensity and brilliance of colour. But this is why people spoke about his work like that. And, you know, it's almost magical. But the point of it is not just to be realistic, it's um, to get capture an atmosphere in a way that it's it, it's um, can be difficult to do um, working in other ways other than glazes. Now, people do it <laughs> all right, but glazing is such a clever way of arriving at this. And breaking down, I'm always talking about this, breaking down art problems into their components and solving one problem at a time. So let me show you what I mean, first of all, by glazes. There are different kinds of glazes, okay? And this is a varnish. A varnish is you glaze your picture when you finished your painting, right? On a, an acrylic painting, you don't have to glaze it afterwards on an oil painting you don't have to glaze it afterwards but a lot of people do and they like the effect that um glazing a picture gives because it kind of um puts a little bit of a sheen on a picture depending on whether you get a satin or a mash varnish as well as protecting the picture from el the elements you know and uh, often you see art restoration things and they're taking off a layer of very old glaze that's discolored. But there's another way to use glazes as well. And this is what I want to talk about today. And I have this stuff here called liquin, which is kind of a jellyish stuff. You know, I'll just uh, put some out to show it to you. I did have a handy uh, lid or something around the place. I had a bigger lid than that. I don't know where I put it. It's probably under my painting here somewhere, but I'll demonstrate on this. I need the flipping top off this. Oh no, it's stuck solid. <laughs> it's also got a childproof lock on, which I'm famous for not being able to get in at. There's something wrong with the top of it. I feel stuck for it. Um oh my god, the whole top is stuck. There we go. <laughs> so uh, just to show you this jelly stuff, that's the consistency of it, okay? Um, but you can get it in a tube as well, this stuff. And there are lots of artists glazing medium. This is uh, for... Uh, I don't actually say on it what, what it's for. So you'd kind of have to know. It just says medium. So you can mix that in with the paint while you're painting, if it's a medium, okay? And this is the sort of glazing we're doing. It's mixing in with something. Now, um, that, to make a glaze for that, here's what I did. I'll just do a very quick demo of how it works. Um, and then I'm going to, we're going to do some live painting demo to explain it further, okay? Now, you need, as well as this stuff, you need, or a similar glazing medium, because you could get something like Damar Varnish is another very popular one that's not written in English, but uh, there is their Damar Varnish. That's another very popular glazing medium, which is a little bit less viscous really it's a bit more watery looking isn't it it's more like a finishing varnish the look of it but that's a very popular glazing medium as well and you need your oil colors or you can get glazing mediums for acrylics so if you're an acrylic painter this will work as well um but you need to uh be working with transparent color rather than uh opaque color so for example that is a primary yellow there that's an opaque color that's uh, not a it doesn't have see-through qualities right but this when you thin it down is quite see-through so that's the first thing to bear in mind that your color has to have a high transparency value and then you also when you're creating a glaze you're watering down the color even more. And your other medium 
that you're using if you're working with oil paints is probably Turps or Sansador or something like that. You can use a little bit of that as well. You don't have to. It depends on what kind of flow you want for something. And that basically is what goes on the, um, the painting on top of something. And um, I haven't got, uh, haven't got, I am going to glaze some things today, but I, what I want to do is start from scratch and we're going to uh, paint some things that you can glaze on top of. Now, I said that you could work with acrylics and glaze with acrylics, didn't I? But there's a clever thing you can do with oil paints, which dry slowly. And what you could do with oil paints, if you're somebody who works with oil paints, is you could paint your um, painting first in acrylics and then work over the acrylics with oils. And that's because acrylics dry very fast. And that's what we're going to do today because of the other technique that I want to talk about, which is Grisaille. And Grisaille basically is working in monotone, black and white. Okay, So we're going to use acrylics for that. And uh, in the hopes that the acrylics are going to dry fast enough that I can work glazes over them in oil paint. Because I've only got an hour today for the demo. So this is the, the best way I can work out the demo. If I were to do... Uh, demonstrate this grisaille in uh, oil paint we'd be waiting having to wait till tomorrow or the next day for it to be dry enough to put a glaze on but if i work with acrylics and i have a black acrylic and a white acrylic that i'm going to use um hopefully i can get it to dry today so i'm just using this bit of acrylic paper for my palette to demonstrate this grisaille. And I did say, didn't I, that grisaille technique. And grisaille technique and um, glazing technique are related. And I'll just, I'll go back to the comments so I can see comments um, if anybody arrives in. And I might not get to... Um, Say hello to everybody. So I'll just say hello now. <laughs> because an hour isn't very long to get through things, is it? So we have our black and white out. So we're going to paint in monochrome. And just to have something to reference, I'll put this aside. I found my little lid that I want to use later for putting the glazing medium in. But we're going to put the oil paint things to one side for a minute. I'll even put the cap on that and move it. And I want to show you these kind of things. Okay. Now, that's a bit like a, a Jan van Eyck's um, red turban, isn't it? But if I said to you we were, could do that in black and white and then make it that fantastic red, and if it was an apple that had reds and yellows and greens and all sorts in it, we can do that as well, just through the use of glazes. You'd say, well, that's a good trick, but it's a fantastic trick because uh, it splits the problem up as well, of the problem that you have to solve. And we're going to use this little prop as a way to help solve the problem as well. So, uh, don't worry if this just makes a whole lot of sense yet. It will when you start to do it. So, we need a little bit of, I'm going to use foil paper to do the demo on for this. And this is um, a nice clear fontaine thing. And, you know, I bought this recently and then I decided I don't really like uh, oil paper very much. So I use canvases a lot. But for this demo, I'm happy enough to use this. And uh, acrylic is okay on oil paper as well. So we're good there. Um, now, I'm going to get a brush for myself. I'm just using a smallish brush and uh, old socks. <laughs> For my rags, so I'm um, sorry for showing you my old socks, but they're very handy for rags. Okay, so now here's what we're going to do. 
I'm going to draw a roundy shape, a pearl kind of shape, and then we're going to let that dry. And I'm going to draw it in a few different sizes. I'm going to let it dry, and then we're going to um, do our experiments. So I'm going to have some grey around it just so it stands out and we want to be able to have a few of them for practicing our experiments in different places on okay and i am hoping this will dry nice and fast but uh, you see i have other paintings to glaze as well so i can work on that while i'm waiting okay now i am being fairly fast about this because I'm not doing a Jan Van Eyck on it. So for something like his portrait, if you have a look at that, there's a lot of drawing skills employed in that, as well as painting skills, and quite a lot of detail in it. So imagine what it might be like if uh, you could eliminate the use of lots of different colours and how them to accurately record all these different colors as well as um as well as drawing the face in monochrome so you've removed half the problem and um this problem you run into that problem constantly when you're painting i ran into it in um, the last painting I was doing, I've run into it in every painting that I'm doing, uh, that I've got to solve colour problems as well as, as well as um, line and plane problems, really, you know. And, um, okay, so I've got a little bit of black background in there for the grey, for the whiteness to sit on, you see, so. And then we can go in here and modulate the grey. And my lighting is coming from up behind the pearl. So I'm going to go a lot whiter here and leave some of the shadow there. So think of paintings like uh, Vermeer's Girl with the Pearl Earring and things for this kind of thing. You could, if you don't have a barrel around the place, try this technique by copying a painting. But, I, you know, I think you only learn so much by copying things, to be honest with you. You do learn something, but when you have to draw it yourself, uh, you possibly learn more, although the quality of your looking at old masters is much improved by copying so perhaps there's that <laughs> to be said for sure. okay and we're not gonna do a huge amount of work up there now this is still wet so putting white on top of it is just bringing it up gradually now you see all these nice little uh brush marks that are being created here they're um kind of a nice part of the painting at the moment and I don't really want to lose them because it's part of the action and spontaneity of the painting to keep them in sorry I keep getting off the camera because I'll be so close in I'm hoping that you can uh, see some detail in today's live stream I think I hit this sweet spot last week <laughs> lucky again okay so that that one there let's see we have our shadow looking good we'll do a little bit more work on the shadow so we're having a lot of fun uh, reducing this to a tonal thing and uh, this is why i picked a pearl basically because a pearl reduces to a tonal thing very easily but if you look at it and um Again, I don't know what you see color wise because everybody's screen is going to be different color wise. But for me, there is a yellow cast on that. This is where glaze comes in. Sorry. <coughs> I got a frog in my throat. Now, so uh, say you were Jan van Eyck, right? Let's 
let's pretend we can always pretend, can't we? <laughs> I'll never be Jack Panuck. <laughs> but I'd, you know, I love pretend. Um, you could um be working away with very fine details and slow down a little bit at this this point to get subtleties of shadows. There's actually a du double shadow out here, for example. Okay. And the reason I want to get some of this detail in is because we're going to come along and glaze it in a while. And I'm going to do the same here. And these are these are just similar kind of paintings of the same thing because I'm going to come along with different colored glazes afterwards when it's dry. You can only glaze really when it's dry. And we're going to do things to these different size pearls in different colors. And within the one uh, painting of a pearl, you can use multiple glazes. So let's think about what that means, we wish, because that's where it gets really exciting. And that's because you can get the same way as in black and white when you're drawing or painting something, you can get fantastic detail into something if you're um, prepared to put in the work and you've got the skill to do so. In the same way, you can get a fantastic subtlety of color going with glazes. So although we're starting out in black, black and white, which is if you think about the word grisaille, you could think of it if you think of it as a monochrome or a black and white technique, you're, you're thinking in the right way. Because that's really what it does mean. I don't know, literally, does it mean that? Because uh, I guess it's, I don't know, I guess it sounds French. But I didn't actually look it up just before this to sound super knowledgeable about what the word actually means. But now, really, see this bit here? I should wait until that acrylic is a little bit drier to do this tip in because the paper is whiter. But I'm just using pasta to try and do that, convey that instead. So you see how I'm adding to the subtlety of the thing. But I don't have to worry about colour. I'm not also looking at colour. Sure, I'm not. Sure, I'm not. That's a real Irish thing to say. This is my Irish glamour, which is totally different. Uh, unique grammatical structure we have. So now I'm looking at this pearl and all down the side, there's a wonderful yellowy color, but I am just putting that in as a gray and reducing the whole thing to tone and saying to myself, it's lighter than the tone beside it. And I'm not gonna spend a super long time doing this because this is only part of the demo and I have to leave time for this thing to dry to show you the demonstration. Um, but uh, I do have other pieces to, while it's drying, to do the demo on that I think um, will help make this clearer all the time as we go along. And <clears throat> you'll love this technique. You will love experimenting with this technique if you've never used it before, uh, it does open up a new world of possibilities. Okay, so you see, it's getting more pearl-like already, isn't it? And we'll keep working away. And if you were working with smaller brushes, you'd be getting sort of blendy brushes out and things to really get the transitions going. But I am super interested in Get the basics down and then letting it dry. <laughs> so there's another little shadow. And I'm basically going to copy this for the purposes of demoing. 
I just want to get rid of it. Actually. And then there's a cup above. So all the time I'm comparing colors to color on the outside. And have a little bit of an impasto or thick paint going for highlights. Now, um, somebody like, um, what's his name? Jan, I like. Uh, might not have used um, impasto, but certainly Rembrandt did. And the little link that I want to put in underneath for you is to a fantastic article about Rembrandt that has wonderful close-ups of some of his uh, glazed paintings because he extensively used glazing extremely effectively. And if you ever go to see, um, I was lucky to see him in Amsterdam, some of his work in Amsterdam, and um, oh, what a great experience that was. But... um. His fabrics and armor and everything that he painted are just, they're so magical and uh, they're so tactile and beautiful. And it was, uh, you know, it was very exciting going to see the work, you know, fantastic experience um, seeing somebody's work up close properly. But um, this, this article is good because it talks about glazing in his work but it also shows you up close details of beautiful uh, armoured headpiece. And it um, contrasts it with the way he's painted the face. So there was a lot of impasto or thick paint on the headpiece. And uh, then he finished the headpiece with all these glazes on top of it that really brought out this amazing depth in the painting. Um, and that was glazes that created that fantastic depth. And some of some of Rembrandt's paintings, they just um, they appear to be magical to me. They just look magical because the effects are so amazing that you are just wowed by them. You go, how the heck did he paint that Even as a painter? Like I, I'm even saying that as a painter, as another painter, you know, he just wows me so much. His, his stuff is just sorry. I'm looking for another brush, and I don't really have one immediately to hand that's the right shape. I don't want to get into my oil painting brushes for this, and I have some very soft brushes. I don't paint in acrylic that often. Ah, I'll stick with the same brush because I'll just start getting too fussy. You tend to see me painting very fast on these streams and I don't necessarily paint that fast in real life. How are you doing time wise? You see half an hour has gone by already. Not a child in the house watched. <laughs> and half an hour gone by. Okay, so but we're um we are getting things done. Just not fast. I just want to get these last two pearls indicated and um, I just want them slightly above a certain level of uh, generalization or the glazes won't look very interesting. There has to be a certain amount of detail on them. So this is a lovely exercise even before you start glazing to um, paint 3D shapes in black and white, uh, apples. Uh, I have a round red dog's ball there and a uh, pearl. You could do a string of pearls if you wanted to. And then if you want to see how other people, you know, compare how other people do it, you can go off and look at various old masters because they were forever painting jewels and pearls and all those sorts of wonderful pictures of um, 16th century pictures of royalty, all in their beautiful pearls, English ones, Spanish ones, all sorts of wonderful art to look at. 
um, and that's very enjoyable. Um, because you can learn from other artists and you can learn from observation. Okay, so now you see the way you could be working away quite happily on those um, for a good while, just in black and white. But uh, they only have a certain level of realism about them, don't they? Because you know that there's, you know, a lot of color absent in them. So we're going to leave them to dry. Then we'll come back to them. And I'm sort of getting tackier. I don't want to have to get a hair dryer out on a live stream. I think I can get them dry enough before the end of the live stream to glaze them. But if I don't, I'll come back and do a bonus live stream tomorrow. How would that be? I don't want to leave you hanging on how to do these techniques. But we are going to go off and glaze some paintings after doing this bit. Okay, so I painted those all the same for a reason, okay? And I, in fact, I was messing around that, that one for ages. Um, and you probably didn't even see me do it. So I'm going to put that aside, let it dry for a few minutes, and then we come back to it. And um, then I'm going to uh, glaze the painting. Um, and it's a, an oil painting. So I'm going to just put this away. But before I put that away, I want to clean fire brush in water because it's acrylic so acrylic underpainting you do not have to do for glazing you don't have to do acrylic underpainting okay and uh, the acrylic underpainting that I did for my oil painting was just to um, facilitate the thing drying faster for demo purposes now you can uh, do a mix and match technique of doing your painting in black and white in acrylic underneath your use of oil paints then if you're somebody who really likes oil paint or if you're somebody who just likes acrylics you could continue on in acrylics but buy an acrylic glazing medium okay not an oil glazing medium so you have to look out for a glazing medium specifically for acrylic Alright, now. now I showed you a painting that I had played, okay. this one, and I'm going to show you uh, glazing an oil painting in real time. Because <laughs> I had this painting that I did in the spring and as you can see it's very light colored it's all different trees and a river and stuff in it but um it, it, it's I like some of the painting things going on with it but I I don't I'm not kind of happy with the color but I had intended when I started, uh, not when I started working on it, but about halfway through, I said some of these colours, I it might be easier to um, get them um, in place. So uh, I'm going to put some of my uh, some of my acrylics aside, and I'm going to get out some of the some of the um, oil paint stuff. Now, I have red oil paint out. I'm not going to use red. I'm going to use blue and uh, possibly a black. So your medium that you use with oil paint, of course, isn't water. So I'm putting the water out of the way. And I have some terps there just for cleaning purposes. And then I have uh, terps here for a medium, for use as a medium as well. 
Now, I want to get a transparent blue. Remember I said you're working with transparent colors. So you would choice blues depending on what kind of blue. I'm a huge fan of Prussian blue. I love it. And I'll show you what that looks like now. Sick. And French ultramarine I love as well. French ultramarine isn't a million miles away from cobalt. And I'll just show you the difference between those two colours. And I'll show you by watering them down. So uh, we're going to be working with some soft brushes, but I'm just using a very small soft brush at the moment to show you the water down version of each colour. Now, I should actually have grey under that. The grass palettes are great, but a good idea is to have something in neutral colour under them because the colour reads a lot better on a neutral. Now, you see that colour? It's kind of a jeansy blue. It's nice. Nice. But we're going to have a look at another blue. And we will just add a tiny little bit of tulips to thin it out. And this blue is a zoomier kind of a blue, cobalt. And um, I can come along with the blue there and put a blue over it. I would normally, if I wasn't doing it on a demo, I might use a colour called Payne's Grey, which I love. Uh, I'll show you Payne's Grey. You might have Payne's Grey in your collection. Um, lamp Black you would have. Mars black or something. Uh, you can mix that in with color if you want to make the color a little bit less uh, intense. And this was a spring painting, so the colors of sky and water and things wasn't that intense. And actually, this had a lot of green in it. So I will be doing glazes in a few colors, one of the colors being uh, greens as well. And I can use a mix of greens. And as you can see, I've got one, two, three colours that I'm talking about using possibly at the moment on this. Now, the only thing I'll say about this is it can be nerve wracking. But on the other hand, <laughs> um, you can remove a lot of the glaze that you put on if you're not happy with it. So... It's not that narrow bracken. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So this is a technique that if you try it, you're going to have a little fun. And the reason I keep lifting this up is I'm looking for a soft brush. Because uh, soft brushes are the key to putting the, getting this on properly. Uh, right shape brush as well would be nice. Okay, so here's a brush I like. It's quite a small brush. Uh, I have a bigger brush around. Ah, here it is. I've actually had brushes ready. These brushes here, all very soft. All right, let's try with a big brush. Now, here's my uh, medium, my varnish medium, which is liquid. Right, that's not the only one out there. There are various ones, but I'm going to use that with um, a Prussian blue. And this is the kind of consistency I want. Okay, now I could put in turps with that if I wanted as well. But uh, if it's if it glides across the canvas, okay, we're good. Now that's quite shocking, isn't it? <laughs> But lovely. Now, watch the way I'm going, just one direction. And I'm going to go over not just this bit, but the whole pants. And already the smell is wonderful. A lot of these kind of uh, varnishes are from natural sources and they smell absolutely wonderful. Um, Damar varnish smells very nice as well. So I'll move this slightly so you can see the actual. 
now that you've seen the kind of consistency that I'm putting on. And I'm moving across, but I'm going to go the other direction as well. So it's not unlike what you do when you're frying it. And I need a little bit more of my liquid. And I'm going to use the bigger lid now that I found it. And this is glazing, okay? So this is a glaze that I'm doing at the moment. In Prussian blue. And the way your Prussian blue would look depends, obviously, on what colours you've got underneath. But you can see everything underneath. So that's kind of exciting already. You see, you haven't wrecked any of the work you've done already. You're just adding. And uh, actually not hitting this part, the handle of the camera is good going. I'm ready to move the camera up and down because uh, it loses focus so easily. I might have to okay, move it up a bit because I don't have paint on it. There. Now, that looks totally different already to the way it looks before. And I'm going the other direction as well. So this is just a one color glaze at the moment. But look at um, the way the water has changed and all the colors in the rest of the painting changed as well. And what we do is if I decide, for example, that parts of the glaze are too strong or I want to keep Say I want to keep some of the little highlights of the white bits. I can get a little bit of my other medium, terps, and come back in here and restore bits. So watch this. See that? I'm actually picking off some of it. And there are other things you can do with the glaze as well. You could, while that uh, layer of glazing is drying, you can re-establish some highlights if you want. So that would be typically what somebody like Rembrandt might do. So I might come along with some white paint. Oh, I'll, I'll demo for you, actually, because I'll have to wait for this layer to dry. So I can only put on one layer today. Uh, this is why I have the other demo set up. Um, I'll show you what uh, re-establishing the white on top of that does for the depth in your painting because it creates this amazing depth. And this time I need a proper oil brush, which is a hot brush. Um, um, I'm using a... Uh, titanium white, which is in bits. I had to do a, a little patch up job on that. So now I couldn't, if I wanted to, say I had uh, done underpainting in um, acrylic in this painting, which I didn't. This is all oils. I couldn't come, come along and paint on top of oils with acrylic. So just be aware of that if you're using this technique. I don't want to confuse you about the idea of using acrylics. It's okay to use acrylics under oils, but not all. Okay, so uh, say I want to make um, some of the bubbles in that really stand out. I can do that. You see, look at them the way they sit over the blue. And then I would let that dry for a while. So I can do two techniques with this glazing. I can lift bits of the glaze off 
and I can add bit, bits of paint on top. Now, if you're adding impasto paint like this, you're looking at leaving that painting alone for another few weeks to dry. And this painting, this is why this painting has been drying since spring. This was painted in spring and it's been drying since spring because you want to dry, you want to put glaze over very dry paint. And sort of drag paint and do all that kind of thing. But um, so you, the glazing, say I come along and I glaze some parts in black into this as well. I come along and do some black. The black, if I then wipe back with my cloth, wipe some of the glaze back, the black only sticks under the edges of the paint, the light paint that I've put on. And um, the sense of depth is amazing. It's, it's just effect. So that's a fantastic effect for you to play with. And um, if you have a look at this part of the painting here, it was a lot duller looking before. Putting the glaze on brings a kind of vibrancy and richness to the colours that... Um, you know, is a bit absent before, you know. Um, and then when I come along here, I can do a little bit be because uh, I don't think I'll work it if I do this bit. I can't do it over the whole painting. But um, the reason I did the blue over the whole painting, right, was to unify the painting through the use of a colour, right? But some bits of the painting, I don't want them as blue. I might want them very yellow. So... Um, Although it'd be ideal to let that dry a bit, I will uh, show you a little bit of a warmer colour in that to show you how you can affect the colour without losing what's behind it. So I'll get out another colour that will sit well with that. slightly disappointing. I was looking for an Indian yellow. I don't have an Indian yellow. But I can uh, demonstrate Viridian for you. Indian yellow is one of the few transparent yellows. So remember I said you've got to use a transparent colour. Um, you could use a colour like uh, that kind of um, primary yellow if you wanted to. But if it's a bit opaque like this, you're going to be covering some of your underneath work with it when you put the glaze on. Whereas if it is a transparent colour, which you would know when you mix it out, thin it down the way I did earlier for my blue, um, if you use a transparent colour, Nothing from underneath is going to lose any of its detail or clarity or colour. So I'll demo this one with Viridian. Had I got a light on that brush? It looks cloudy. So you see the way that colour just got really intense suddenly. And now say I decide, uh, oh, it's very dark. I don't like that dark. Uh, you can take some bits off and it's only then going to stick in the depths of the impasto paint. So in the ridges kind of. And when you look in here, if you look at it sideways, you can see that that is a very built up paint. So if I get my clean old sock out again, and if you're wiping back with cloths, don't have something too soft that 
that's got any kind of a um hairiness about it. So we've still got the Viridian showing through, but we've got the original colors as well. Okay, so now you should be starting to see the sense of um, what, how you can introduce color into something or modify color. So in this one, it, this uh, glazing on this one was very much about modifying color. And if I decided that some of the shadows, for example, um, I wanted them uh, darker, I can use transparent colors again. And with a soft brush, brush things in. So we're getting more sort of intensity into the color. And you don't have to wipe back, but I just want them to stick in the ridges. So I am wiping back. So actually this fabric will get her brush. This is kind of a lycra. Excuse me. So, uh, you know, and if I decided that that was too blue, I can just do a red glaze on it. Then I want to make it a bit more purple put a blue on top and the blue and the red together and make a purpley kind of a darkness. So you're building something with gradual. But uh, it would be better to do, to let each coat of glaze dry before you put another one on up there. So this would solve many painting problems. For example, I did, I've been doing very impasto paintings and this just got, went way past all the other day. But um, when I looked at it after I painted it, there were whole sections of it that I thought, oh, they're a bit samey colour wise. And I didn't want it all this kind of grey, blue. Some of the areas were more greenish up here. But I don't want to really lose the um the color I had underneath completely, or have to scrape the thing down and put more color on. So I can wait till that dries. Come along. Well, now this would be the winter by the time I'd be able to work on this one again with the glaze because it's so impastoed. But um, if I put a glaze of a warmer green on, like a sap green, I'm going to get um. Uh, that color modified from being slightly less like this to being slightly warmer. And it's a very subtle uh, change that can be accomplished. And you'll see things sometimes in paintings like skies. You'll say, I don't know if that sky is blue or yellow. It seems to have a bit of everything in it. In old masters, you notice this a lot. And uh, it can be because there's glazes. It's glazed to achieve very subtle effects. So let's see how we're doing on this painting, whether we've got any of it drying. It's not it's not really dry in a lot of bits, but we've got some of it dry. So we'll we'll try. We'll try doing a little bit of glazing. So uh I've only got four minutes left to do that. So uh let's see what brush was I using this one. And I'm gonna get Oh no, it's, we're doing it oil. We're doing it oil over acrylic. But remember I said, if you were using acrylic, which this is, you can also get acrylic glazing mediums. But for oil painters, if you want your painting to dry quickly, this is a technique that this would dry much quicker than oils because it's acrylic. And then you can come along and do the rest of your painting in oils. So that's another idea for you to play with there if you're an oil painter and uh, you have a great time with that because you're able to do experiments that you don't have to wait three quarters of the year and two changes of seasons to actually accomplish you know so wouldn't that be nice so uh, I was talking about the yellow color wasn't I in everything and let's say for example um that I can find it. I, I have used up all my favorite oil colors this week. But, uh, 
And some of them aren't easy to get all this. So I'm looking at the moment for transparent golden oak in my box of tricks. Yellow oak. Oh, there's Indian yellow. Look, let's see if we can get a coax any out of that. That is the most beautiful color for glazing. Uh, I don't have to cut this. I was looking for transparent gold ochre, which I might have a tiny squidge of somewhere. But... Now, that looks like an ochre, but it isn't. And the reason I didn't want to use just straight yellow ochre is. Yellow ochre is not a transparent color. So remember I said you're better using transparent colors. But uh, some of this experimentation stuff, you find out for yourself, you see. Now, ooh, do you know what this is made from, this color? Cowpea. <laughs> Honestly. It's a very expensive color. Who knew the cowpea would be so expensive? But it is. Now, uh, so there's, if I wanted it a less goldeny yellow, which I might have liked, uh, except that I've only got a few minutes left, a transparent gold ochre would have been giving me the sort of yellow that I want there. And I'm trying to avoid the lightest highlights. They're not quite dry. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? I can't actually mess this around too much because there's bits that aren't dry yet. But this bit is dry. I can mess that around. So look at what I can do. I can get a yellow shadow over a grey, which is really interesting. And I can have my uh, little pearl look kind of yellow. So you see how uh, that break breaks the problem down wonderfully because I was able to do the thing in black and white first. And um, then I can come along and modify things with other glaze colors. So this is a glaze made of my alizarin crimson, some black and some Prussian blue. And I'm going to water it down a little bit more with my medium and spread it out and I can make that shadow more subtle. So isn't that beautiful, the subtlety in that? And then I can continue to work in here, not the not the best shape brush to do it in, but I can continue to do work in there. So obviously, with that thin glaze and some blending going on, I'll get a better blendy brush to show. You. And you can bet Jan Van Eyck had his little blendy brushes out for some of the amazing things he did. Rembrandt, not so much, I wouldn't say, because a Rembrandt, although he does, he gets fine details and things, he can get fine details in the most amazing ways. I'm going to go into a green here by having a, um, my Prussian blue and my Indian yellow mixed. And just modify the color over on this side. So that I'm introducing like a little bit of a greenish light over here. So I can keep doing weird things with the color. As if it's kind of changing as it's as it's moving around. And we'll just try a, a different color of clay. Sorry, it's it's mixing with the white there a little bit where it's not quite dry yet. 
But you're, you know, you're getting, you're getting what I'm trying to explain. Isn't that amazing? So this little pearl here is kind of a green one. We'll finish with a red one. We have two two pearls left. We'll leave one white for comparative purposes. And don't forget this wiping back idea that you can wipe back. So you can go right back to the original, to the grey. Look, at we've left some grey in there. We've gone back to the grey. So we'll experiment with the red. And, you know, obviously you can mix a few colours in together at the same time. Uh, that one isn't dry there yet, either. But enough to show you. Aren't they nice? And uh, look at when you put one glaze over another, you know, that glaze would have been better had I let it dry first, but that's okay. You can actually work glazes like this, but you have to be um, gentle with them to do that. So you can see how if I do, did a face, right, say I was, say I was again, <laughs> say I was Jan again, <laughs> uh, Jan van Eyck, and I was doing that portrait. Um, imagine this section here is um, the skin, doing the skin. Sorry, my, my camera won't uh, stop anywhere. Stop. So that bit there, I can modify the skin color by layering various things. And I can work in shadowed areas as well, you see. See that? So um, even from this few little glazes on it, you can see the kind of depth coming out of it and um, how you can see everything still underneath. You can modify colours, take some yellow out of that with a, a dark, a black glaze. But we've still got all our underpainting shown. So isn't that exciting, folks? Don't you think that's good? And uh, I think you could really get, enjoy playing with that. And have a look at the little link that I'm going to give you afterwards. And think about it in relation to, like, this one in particular reminds me of it. Um, the headdress. That, see, that's even sitting in the edge of the, it should be dry, but isn't, <laughs> white um, highlight, um, you'd be able to see in that article about Rembrandt how he used this technique. So uh, come back and look at the video and in a few minutes, refresh the page or something, and I'll have that link as the first comment, pinned comment for you. So uh, I hope you got something out of that. Hope you really enjoyed it. And hope you have a go at the exercise, whether you're working at it in acrylics or oils, or you want to use the technique where you can use both. Because um, you're going to have a great time and you're going to keep wanting to play with it and everything. And it's so lovely and subtle and gorgeous that how could you not have fun doing it? I mean, it's great. Even in the same object, you can get uh, so much subtlety of colour going on. So uh, it's a good trick, isn't it? Really good trick. I like it, I must say. Uh, so, yeah. So glazes and the one I was using today was that one, in case you're interested in uh, purchasing the same one. That's for oil paints. Uh, I don't have an example of one for acrylics, but if you just look up acrylic glazing medium, find some. Okay. See you folks, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I have